This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On January the 16th, our first Virtual Defence and Security Studies Committee event of 2024 featured George Takach, former head of the High Tech Law Group at McCarthy Tetro, speaking on Cold War 2.0. Artificial Intelligence in the New Battle Between China, Russia, and America. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first RCMI Defense and Security Studies Program event for 2024. Um, most of you have seen me before. I'm, I'm Dr. Dan Eustace, and I'm the director of that program, and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this event today. Um, we have an excellent uh, turnout. Uh, which is great, and I have, I think that's a combination possibly of the the excellent choice of speaker and the topic, but also perhaps maybe a change in time. Um, and the reason for that is because um, George is very dedicated to his work, and he is uh, equally dedicated to skiing. And uh, not to reveal anything secret here, but evidently he is somewhere in France. And uh, therefore, he is about, are you six hours ahead, George, or five, six? Six hours. Six hours ahead. So he's 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 ready for bed at any time now, but we're going to keep him awake for at least the next hour for sure. So uh, thank you very much for uh, for being committed to this uh, to this event, George. Right. So here we are. This is today's subject matter, Cold War 2.0, Technology and Geopolitics, uh, a presentation to the RCMI. Uh, by George Takish, and this is really all uh, contained in his new book. It's not out on the market yet. We'll talk about that later on when when, when we're all finished or close to finishing. Um, but I got very interested in this book because George, through a friend of his, um, was looking for someone to take a look at, it, at the book in the manuscript form, and I had the opportunity to do that. And I found it extremely interesting and informative. And I thought, well, we need to do something with this book. And we could do a book launch, but I thought, and we 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 may well do that. But I thought at the same time, it would be very interesting for us to hear from George directly about his, his ideas that are contained in that book. So what I'd like to do now is just introduce our speaker. Um, next slide, please, Sanucha. And there we are. So um, George has a wide range of experience. He's a, he's a lawyer. Um, he has uh, an excellent education. Note, note the MA in, in School of International Affairs at Norman Patterson in Carleton. Um, so he's, he, he knows a lot more about uh, international affairs than he, he actually pretends to. Um, but he's had a very interesting career, uh, 35 plus years in practicing technology law. And I found that quite interesting because technology obviously runs through the entire theme of his book and, and a lot of what he will be talking about with us today. Um, adjunct professor at Osgood. Um, when you when you Google George, you're going to find out that he's written other books. Uh, this is not his first uh, attempt. He's got other books dealing with computer law um, and took a run at the federal level party leadership back in 2013, which is 10 years ago, 11 years ago, time flies. So uh, an excellent uh, background, um, has done a lot of research on his current book. And I believe he's also, when he's not skiing, doing some research for his next book, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so we're, uh, we're very happy to have George with us today. Um, as I mentioned, he's about six hours ahead of us, but that's not uh, completely relevant to what he's talking about. Uh, it is relevant to the fact that we have continued our um, our practice since COVID hit of having uh, remote speakers. It allows us to have excellent speakers from anywhere in the world, and we're continuing with that, although we are, as you're going to see near the end of uh, my comments today, we are slowly shifting back towards um, in-person activities as well. So it's a balance. And uh, so that's great that we were able to convince George to do this for us from his remote location. So with that, I'm going to now uh, turn this over to George and I will uh, 
be on mute and I'll be listening. And when the time comes, I will moderate the question and answer period. So welcome, George. Nice to see you. And thanks for doing this. So Thanuj, if you'd go to the next slide, and then George will take over from there. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And um, maybe just uh, a quick word about that last bullet on the previous slide about the, the run for the liberal uh, leadership, because there is a tech dimension there as well. Uh, in a nutshell, it was an open convention. You didn't have to be a, a member of the Liberal Party and you could sign up online. And the um, strategy that my campaign manager who had won the race with Stefan Dion previously, uh, what we came up with was there are a million and a half heavy duty computer gamers in Canada. And I was the tech candidate. I had a very tech heavy agenda for the country. Um, and I still believe that we're, we're not batting as, uh, as powerfully as we could on the tech side. Um, to make a long story short, we signed up a bunch of computer gamers, but not enough. And when uh, Justin Trudeau had a 12 page color spread in the middle of McLean's magazine about uh, him and his family, uh, I looked at my campaign manager and we both said, yeah, but computer gamers don't read McLean. So, so maybe we should just keep going. So, but to your point, um, tech is a theme uh, in my career. And that's why the title of the book is Cold War 2.0. And I'll weave that tech component uh, into my remarks uh, as I go through here. But first, the bad news on this screen. Um, the bad news is we are in a new Cold War. And I get there uh, by thinking conceptually about what a Cold War is. I offer this uh, sort of dual definition. It's basically when the primary ordering principle, you know, what, what is it when, when Joe Biden gets up in the morning uh, and thinks about China, he, he's not thinking about cultural exchange or tourism or, or even economics. Uh, he's thinking about near kinetic conflict and frankly, how to avoid real kinetic conflict over the South China Sea and Taiwan. But beyond that, and this is the second uh, part of my definition of a Cold War, uh, the protagonists have to fundamentally disagree over how they order society. I mean, that's the ideological basis uh, for, for the concept. And, you know, those of you who were born sort of before 1970 and have memories, not just history reading, but memories of the first Cold War, the ideological divide was communism versus capitalism, broadly speaking. Um, halfway down this slide, under B, examples of B, you'll see that I've transformed that just a little bit into autocracy versus democracy. So China and Russia are the two protagonists that are in the autocratic camp. The United States, the leading democracy, but followed by uh, our NATO partners, uh, and allies, but also Japan, South Korea, and as you saw on Saturday uh, in Taiwan, uh, the rigorous uh, and very impressive democracy that, that Taiwan has going for it. And in this um, new Cold War, um, there are some parallels to the first one, and then there are some, some deviations and, and some new elements. Um, the main commonality, frankly, is that the uh, current protagonists uh, do not like, Russia and, and, and China do not like the so-called rules-based international order, even though China in particular has done fabulously well by plugging into the rules-based international order. When you hear the phrase, oh, you know, 
800 million Chinese have been pulled out of poverty and are, are approaching middle class. That's because if you walk into a Walmart store in Canada or the U.S., you know, 80% of the non-grocery merchandise is, is made in, in China. And that fact is bolstered by and is a product of the rules-based international trading order in that particular instance. And they've done very well by it. But since about a decade ago, this is my point about, well, when did this new Cold War begin? Um, both Russia and China have, have really started to turn their back on the rules-based international order, and they're both proceeding down the path of brute force or might is right. And I'll get to a good example. I mean, I think everybody on this call is probably very familiar with what's been going on in the Ukraine uh, war in terms of uh, Russia's activities, uh, but I'll get to the South China Sea in a moment. The last point on this slide, though, uh, that I did want to emphasize is, is, is why bother calling it a Cold War? You know, George, I'm sometimes asked, George, do, doesn't that just make things more difficult for people? And isn't it argumentative and, and even inflammatory? My counter to that is that there's actually real value in calling it a Cold War. First of all, it tells the autocrats that you know, we're on to you and we're collectively on to you and we know what's going on. And then most importantly, it tells our own publics. I think in democracies, it's absolutely critical that the general population be brought along on key foreign policy direction. And frankly, after the initial Russian invasion, of Ukraine in 2014, where they annexed Crimea, if the democracies had been more muscular about calling it a Cold War, I think we could have raised the level of response. We could have set expectations within populations about, you know, Cold Wars can be difficult. They can require sacrifice. They can require financial contribution and they take time. And if we'd have done a bunch of things in the wake of the initial annexation of Crimea, I think we could have deterred uh, the full-scale invasion, you know, eight years later in February, 2022. So I think there's real value in calling it a Cold War. But um, just one other thought on this slide, in the second bullet, the non, kinetic conflict activities that go on are cognitive warfare, so the disinformation, the meddling in elections, uh, the, the social media dimension to the new world that we live in, gray zone tactics. I was actually in Taiwan a couple of months ago for a few weeks and to hear how that population has reacted, I think, with great resilience uh, to the so-called gray zone tactics that China employs, the floating missiles over uh, the country and having them land in the ocean just on the other side, imposing, frankly, a near blockade uh, in the wake of Nancy Pelosi's visit and so on. Um, those are what are commonly called gray zone tactics, economic coercion, where uh, China has become very active in using its economic heft to, uh, to coerce other countries, Canada included. And then hot proxy wars. Obviously the, the nuclear weapon uh, deterrence factor keeps, in Cold War I, it kept Russia from a direct conflict with the United States, but there were plenty of proxy wars, the Korean War and so on. Um, and we have that today. So Russia won't go up directly against NATO, but it will take on 
uh, another fledgling democracy, uh, na namely Ukraine. But as I said, I think everybody's pretty up the curve on Ukraine. Let's go to the next slide. I just want to spend a minute on the South China Sea dispute, because this one I find is not getting uh, the kind of coverage and resonance that it should. And frankly, I think it illustrates perfectly this shift from supporting a rules-based international order to the brute force dynamic. If you look closely at this map, so obviously it's a map of China in white, but notice as well, uh, just off the east coast uh, of China uh, is Taiwan, and it is colored white as well. So um, this map appeared in, in textbooks uh, quite recently as the new map of China, and um, they're already painting in Taiwan as, as part of China. But the so-called nine dash line, which starts um, just off the coast of, of the middle of Vietnam is the first dash, and then it proceeds down towards uh, Malaysia, and then it does a right turn and goes up. And um, you see um, in the Philippines, uh, the Luzon Island, there are two dashes, and then there's two dashes just east of Taiwan. That's the so-called nine dash line. It's been extended to 10 dashes to, uh, to better uh, capture Taiwan. This is the uh, maritime territory that China is claiming is rightfully theirs. And it's an egregious, astounding 90% of the South China Sea. And this nine dash position is diametrically opposed to international law, to the law of the sea treaty and convention that China in fact signed itself and as as did Russia. Um, but this is the new brute force approach of the of the of the autocracies. We're not going to subscribe to the rules-based international order. We have the heft, we have the buildup in the Chinese military, the People's Liberation Army, and we'll be able to prevail on this delineation of maritime sea rights. And the Philippines um, has been fighting this perhaps most vociferously. They took China to the International Court of Justice where under the rules-based international order, these disputes are, are heard and settled. Um, China didn't even show up. They, they, they didn't have, um, the respect for the process to engage in it. And to this day, and you might be following this, um, the Philippines is starting to push back on not just this nine dash delineation, but within that territory that they've delineated, uh, the Chinese are militarizing islands. And in my book, I actually have a, a side by side image of a before shot uh, of a little atoll, uh, beautifully green and gorgeous, uh, just as you would imagine a, a Pacific island. And then the aftershot is after China builds a, an airstrip, um, radar facilities, missile launch facilities, and so forth, and basically has militarized the entire island, all within the Filipino exclusive economic zone, you know, an egregious transgression of the rules-based international order. So that's the bad news. Th this is what we're up against. So let's go to the next slide. So what I do in the book, uh, and given my background in tech-oriented questions for the last 35, 40 years, is Starting with 2014 and the annexation of Crimea, the activity around the South China Sea heated up in 2014, the initial protests in Hong Kong started heating up around 2014. 
I was actually really dismayed at the lack of the response of the democracies. Um, I can remember, like it was yesterday, Barack Obama meeting the then Supreme Leader of, of mainland China, asking him, you know, politely as, as Barack Obama does, you know, please don't militarize uh, the South China Sea. Uh, the Chinese leader said, oh, okay, that's fine. You know, we, we won't do that. And, and they actually, you know, slowed down um, the construction for a few months. And then of course, just, just kept, just kept on. And, and there was nothing in response coming uh, suitably from, from the democracies. And, and I found this very strange because in my technology work, uh, as a lawyer and, and as a quasi business person, I just thought that the democracies were so far ahead of the autocracies in the elements that drove national economic and military power. And yet we weren't taking positions commensurate with that power that we that we have. And so what I do in the book is I look at four technologies in particular, artificial intelligence, particularly high-end semiconductor chips, quantum computing and biotechnology. And sure enough, in every one of these categories, um, we are ahead of the Chinese, we're way ahead of the Russians. And I won't get into you know, all the gory details, but I'm, I'm into tables. I focus on companies, particularly in the civilian side, um, because one of the defining factors of these sorts of technologies today is that they're extremely dual use. They may come out of the civilian side, but then they get applied into the military or they come out of the military like GPS and then they get applied on the civilian side. And so here we are with really, really powerful technology and innovation assets and yet and yet we're just not responding uh, to the autocracies appropriately now there's another chapter in the book that talks about some other very important technologies but they're not in the big four but when you talk about you know fusion energy for instance um, again the democracies are way ahead and so on and so forth. The one area where um, you know, Russia still has some relevance is in atomic power. Uh, Rosatom is their champion in that field. Um, and they have bits and pieces here and there, as does China. But overall, when you look at the big picture, um, but in detail, industry by industry, um, we're about two to one particularly when you include the democracies outside of the United States. The United States is clearly the leader, but when you layer on Japan, South Korea, Germany, France, the UK, and Canada in some technologies, and Australia in some others, um, we really do look pretty good in the league tables. But, and then now let's go to the next screen. Um, the good news gets better because I don't just deal with the league tables of what's today. I actually scratch below the surface of, of why is it that the democracies do better when it comes to technology and innovation. And fundamentally, well, he, here are the, the five or six dynamics, but the, the headline is, that democracies are better at innovation than the autocracies for structural reasons. And the first bullet is, is, the, is the kicker, that market-based, when you have an open economy, the bottom-up innovation beats top-down command economy innovation every day. So for instance, uh, the Chinese uh, have just announced their, their big new entrant in the commercial uh, airliner space. They are sick and tired of having to pay billions of dollars a year 
to Airbus and Boeing. And so they've come up with their own airliner, the C919. And you may have seen it in the news. It's doing test flights uh, both within China. And the last one I saw was a picture of it flying over Hong Kong for the international market. But again, when you scratch below the surface, while the fuselage was made in China and while the plane is assembled in China, the engines, they come from the democracies. The avionics, the very sophisticated software that drives you know, modern aviation, whether civil or military, it's all from the so-called West, the democracies. And that's because the Chinese have tried and cannot produce a world-class, you know, top of the line jet engine. And <clears throat> I go into the book, in the book, I go into a number of examples like that, that actually um, mirror some of the ones that came up in Cold War I. And then they are now, in a sense, paralleling in Cold War 2.0. History never repeats itself exactly. But when you read my examples, you'll say, wow, it, it sure rhymes a lot. And, and that's what I found in the, in the facts, which um, again, should give us confidence and comfort that technology wise, we're, we're really, our system is better. Um, the other thing that you'll see in the league tables is how many more players we have. So, in quantum, the Chinese have one superb researcher at one superb university, and that's it, really, at a world-class level. Quantum in the West, in the democracies, is at least nine of, of, of companies slash university combinations that are the equivalent of this fellow and his one facility in China. And when you dig into quantum, it's, it's early days. There are several ways of doing quantum and our nine prospects are spread over the three main technologies to do quantum and their eggs are in one basket. So just by definition, in terms of, of the odds, um, we're gonna do better with our multiple private bets versus a single champion. And then you get into some of the social determinants, uh, gender equality, you know, the president of AMD, the, the second leading chip manufacturer in the world, you know, is a woman, Ginny Romady, you know, ran IBM, and they're doing some fascinating things on uh, very high end chips, particularly in a joint venture with Japan. And basically, you know, look at Xi Jinping's leadership group, and his wider group within the top echelons of the Communist Party of China, and women are really hard to find. And basically, the autocracies deny gender equality such that you know, you're excluding half of your population from participating. And when it comes to tech and innovation, I mean, you, you just can't do that if you wanna play in, in the top league. Same with social diversity. Um, I write uh, about a number of examples, the, the inventors of some of the early uh, <clears throat> transistors and, and chip products and so forth, um, you know, immigration into not just Silicon Valley, but it's in Canada across the spectrum from, from Vancouver to Halifax and in our universities, as well as our startup companies. If you can't do immigration right, um, you are not going to succeed in Cold War 2.0. And, and China has a real problem in that regard. So does Taiwan, by the way, um, for another discussion. And of course, Russia now in its semi-pariah state, um, it's lost close to 420,000, give or take. Um, really good creative class people, the, the programmers and the technologists and so on. And of course, nobody's interested in moving to Russia to, to start into these technologies. 
And then finally, private source financing. This is the last league table that I have in this part of the book. And if you look at both venture cap financing, so private market financing, and then public financing in the public markets, um, yes, China has a stock exchange uh, or two. Hong Kong has one. But when you look again at the global numbers between the American financial scene and then you layer in uh, Western Europe, Canada to a certain extent, uh, again, the, the, the money coming out of the democracies is simply so much greater that it makes sense that we would do better on these metrics. But the good news needs to be operationalized. And so this brings us to uh, the last screen. You know, what is it that the democracies have to do to parlay their technological lead and, and frankly dominance uh, into prevailing in Cold War 2.0? The first bullet, build high quality alliances. Uh, now this group may be quite up the curve on AUKUS, which was announced between the Australians, the, the Brits and the Americans in um, 2021. It is a fascinating alliance. Basically those three countries are pooling nuclear power propulsion technology for submarines in a way that uh, frankly, I think is, is unprecedented. It was initiated by the Australians who have zero capability in nuclear power. So they're starting from ground zero. They've looked at the Western Pacific and their position in the Western Pacific, and they've decided they need nuclear power subs. And the Americans have bought in because they get amplification of their nuclear powered sub force. And this is just nuclear power. It's not nuclear weapons on the subs, just to be clear. And the UK, which has had something like this going with the Americans for some time, they're in on it as well. Sadly, it's not the caucus uh, quartet or the AUKUS can quartet. Canada is not a member of this. Uh, we can talk about that in the Q&A, uh, or it might be a an entire separate subject. And it's really ironic that we're not there because we do have very significant, serious and sustained experience with nuclear power, particularly on the civilian side. And AUKUS isn't just nuclear powered subs, it's AI and it's quantum, two of the four that were on my list. And Canada actually has much stronger credentials in both AI and quantum than Australia does. And whether it's because we weren't invited or whether we kind of could have been invited, but we refused, we're not there. And, and I think that's, uh, that's devastating. On the Chinese side, this, the 919, the C919 that I spoke about earlier, it actually started as the CR919, China, Russia, C and R. And the original intent of that alliance, that JV, joint venture, was to bring Russian jet propulsion technology to the table. So they would supply the engines and the avionics, all the stuff that now is coming from the West. And bottom line, uh, those discussions crashed and burned, and it was basically fundamental mistrust. Uh, the Russians thought the Chinese were just going to rip them off, and it is not the product of a Russian-Chinese joint venture. So remember that speech that Xi Jinping said, you know, we have a limitless partnership? Well, it has limits. And autocrats aren't good at building alliances and the democracies are, again, I think structurally so, because we're, we're, we're open, we're used to you know, operating under the rule of law, we're used to compromising with others, and so we do joint ventures and alliances much better than they do. 
The second bullet point, what else do we have to do? Well, we have to increase defense spending. It was perhaps understandable after 1989 and the collapse of, of the Soviet empire and the West winning Cold War I that you know, we, we reduced defense spending and we reduced defense military uh, manufacturing capability and scale, but now it's time to ramp up. And if you need a good example, look at Poland, they get it. Unfortunately, uh, Canada is, is not there. And again, happy to talk about some details in the Q&A. Third, we need to technologically decouple from the autocracies. And there's been a lot of talk about, is the word decouple, is it de-risk? Um, what I do in the book is I settle on technological decoupling. So it's not a complete decoupling. Going back to that Walmart example, everything that you see in Walmart that comes from China, you don't decouple from that, that's fine. But anything that's te technologically sophisticated and particularly requires that democracy expertise that we have and that the Chinese don't, uh, we have to stop giving them the stuff. And to their credit, the Biden administration started this in October of 2022, when they finally got around to shutting down generically the export of high-end semiconductor chips, and most critically, the equipment that makes high-end semiconductor chips. And interestingly, and again, why alliances matter, the most technologically sophisticated chip-making machine in the world is actually built not by the Americans, but by a Dutch company, ASML, in combination with two very critical component suppliers, uh, both German, who make the lasers and the optics. Uh, each one of these machines is a cool $300 million price tag. And this is what TSMC, the world's leading chip fab company in Taiwan, uses to make those high-end chips. And we're shutting that down. The Americans are shutting that down. The Japanese, who are also very big in the supply chain, are going along. The Dutch are going along. And the Chinese are furious. At the San Francisco summit, when uh, Xi Jinping sat down with Biden and Xi Jinping started on his list of, of big issues, Taiwan was number one, and this was number two. You know, you're choking us by shutting off chip exports to China. And it's not just the chips, which are now in virtually everything that you turn on and that runs on electricity has chips in it. It's just that the highest end chips are required to both develop and then use artificial intelligence. So for a long time, the Americans wondered, how are we gonna shut down the export of AI? Well, this is how you do it. So we're in the right direction, but we have to start thinking, well, what about those jet engines for the C919? Do we put jet engines on the list? You know, what's technologically sophisticated and possibly usable for military versus stuff that we're okay with? And then these sanction regimes, this is bullet four. Um, <clears throat> you probably uh, saw there was a, a news report out just yesterday or even this morning that Boeing and Airbus have shut down supplies of spare parts to Russia. And yet two years later, some spare parts are still getting through, through Central Asia, Singapore, and so on. We have to do better enforcement of sanctions regimes. And again, I, I talk about this in the book and some of the ways to come at it. Some people say, oh, but it's like whack-a-mole, you know, that game at the, the fall fair where the the moles come up and you have to beat them back uh, as, as part of the game. Um, and they say, well, it's too hard. It's like whack-a-mole. My view is, yeah, it is whack-a-mole. And we have to get really good at whacking moles. And that's what we need to do here. Rebuild advanced military industrial capacity. Um, it's not enough to invent. 
and improve these technologies, you then have to build the units. Uh, I've become extremely impressed with South Korea over the last year and a half. If you look at Poland's huge increase in military spend on kit, because they're very nervous that a Trump presidency might take the US out of NATO in a major way and they, they have to defend themselves against, uh, against Moscow. Half of the Polish spend is being spent in South Korea because they can make cheaper product, tanks, you name it, not as good as an Abrams, but good enough. Not as good as a Leopard, but good enough. And they can do it quickly and much more reasonably priced. And that's a real challenge that, that we've got. Finally, just to wrap up, build resilient digital economies for that cognitive warfare point that I mentioned earlier. We have lots to learn from the Taiwanese. We have lots to learn from the Estonians. And we have to start seriously thinking about Counter-Strike. 99% um, of the discussion on cyber is defending ourselves. Uh, and you'll see in the book, I have some pretty controversial suggestions like shutting down the internet in Russia for 15 or 20 minutes every time they do a major ransomware attack as they've done in Southwestern Ontario against our health centers. Um, yeah, they're not using kinetic bombs yet, but these are very serious incursions into the Canadian you know, required medical system. And we don't counter-strike nearly enough with cyber and we need to do it better. And it's an area where Canadians could really, really participate in, um, in figuring that out. We need to adopt standards for tech regulation, you know, and again, maybe we'll get into it in the QA, but you know, how do we regulate AI and so forth? The Chinese are using AI principally to surveil their own citizens and to frankly implement oppression regimes um, that would never fly muster in a democracy. And they're exporting these technologies and systems so far to about 80 countries in the global South. And that's the global dimension of Cold War 2.0. We have to keep doing our technology pursuant to democratic principles, human rights, rule of law. And over time, uh, the hope is that a bunch of those 80 countries that are currently run by autocrats in the global south, that when those freedom movements arise, they'll be able to switch over to our democratically friendly tech systems. Push back on autocratic Cold War tactics. I mentioned that one for cyber. And then finally, uh, I have a couple of passages in the book that again will, will raise some eyebrows, but someone's got to say it. We have to be beware of the autocrats and the appeasers within the democracies. You know, and I'll put my cards on the table. When Donald Trump says, you know, he will solve the war in Ukraine in a day. Um, I think we all know what that is code for. It's he's going to sell Zelensky down, down the river. And I fear greatly what he might do with Taiwan. He'll do some trade deal with, with, with Beijing and Taiwan will be thrown into the mix. And that would be devastating. Uh, just to finish, I, as I said, I was in Taiwan. It's a vigorous democracy. It's a robust civil society. They do democracy, frankly, better than Canadians and Americans do it. Um, they have 92% production of the high-end chips in the world. You know, Taiwan is precisely the kind of country that we have to support. And I worry a lot about what um, another Donald Trump presidency would, would mean for that. So Dan, with that, uh, I'm going to wrap up and uh, over to you for moderating Q&A. Yeah, I should be good. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, George. That was, uh, that was great. You covered an awful lot of ground. Um, 
And uh, there are questions coming through. Let me start off with one. I don't think we can answer the question, but I want to wrap it into a second one. Um, so as you mentioned, given that Canada was left out of the AUKUS agreement um, or refused to join due to the nuclear submarine component, and we don't really know. The government has never come forward, I don't think, and said whether they were invited and we turned them down or we weren't invited. I don't think anybody knows. Well, somebody knows it, but I don't think it's out there in the public sphere as to how that actually uh, came down. Um, but even in spite of that, you you started to allude to some technology issues uh, related. I said, so my question is, dude, do you believe that we, we being Canada, have the ability to create and maintain leading edge technologies that would perhaps provide Canada with greater influence in the Western states? And can you come up with maybe one or two specific examples you might be aware of? Well, just to finish on, on August, because what it illustrates is for a country the size of Canada or the size of Australia, it, it is actually really hard to do something without a collaborative dynamic involving the US, involving the UK. Um, you know, Perrin Beattie, 1987, I remember like it was yesterday. Um, he went home, he wrote up the defense white paper called for 12 nuclear powered subs because we need them for the Arctic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And something like that technology, interestingly, Taiwan just finished launching an electric diesel sub more or less on its own. I mean, it had a lot of components from other democracies. Um, I wouldn't recommend Canada doing something like that. And I think to your narrow question, it was the it was the dollar price tag. Um, the Australians are probably going to pay anywhere from seven to ten billion dollars a year for thirty years to play in that space. So, if we could get our spending up from one point three percent to two percent of GDP, and if that's let's say another twenty billion a year. You know, we'd have to devote half of that to a, a nuclear powered sub program. So that's a lot of dough. Um, what other independent technology, though, could we do? Uh, the one I alluded to earlier is something that I'd be very interested to, to pursue because we have expertise in it, which is this cyber attack counter attack. Um, again, I wouldn't do it alone. Um, but I would get some friends, particularly in Taiwan, in the tech space, um, who have to deal with this a lot and come up with some technology. It'd be very AI oriented, which we do well across this country, both in Montreal, Toronto, Edmonton. And something like that could be something where we have a solution that's maybe a Taiwanese, Canadian, you know, Dutch kind of trifecta. And then we start to sort of buy our way back into credibility. But the other point is simply, we, we've got to spend 2% to as table stakes. So until that happens, <laughs> I don't think we're going to get a lot of AUKUS invites right. where we are now. To sort of carry on down that uh... Uh, down that path a little bit, um, we're certainly starting to see more of a confluence between sort of the, I, don't, I wouldn't call it traditional cyber attacks on systems and whatnot, uh, uh, but combined with, um, call it cyber crime, uh, you know, where, where we have ransomware and we have folks, you know, defrauding companies and doing all kinds of things to affect uh, that and, and and using those systems to to generate revenue uh, for the for the autocracies. Would you would you advocate you know the sort of pushback in that regard as well, or would or would you turn that you know it's a question of who's responsible. Does it does it become a national you know federal government 
thing to be looked at from from CSIS or CSE, or is it really an RCMP, you know, uh, policing matter? And it gets complicated because those it starts to blur uh, in the middle. Yeah, where, where I'd like to see it, and and NATO has started to do some thinking about this, but it's it's at a glacial pace, and it's this phenomena in the tech world today that a lot of the players are not state players. They are companies, they're organizations, they're criminal groups, but they sit in offices within Russia, within China, within Iran, within North Korea. They are known to the, to the authorities, and in many cases, they, they pay money to them. And there's a long tradition of this in history. I'm a big history buff, and you'll see history sort of peppered throughout the book. Uh, Sir Francis Drake, you know, how did he get his, his knighthood? It's he went out with private ships, the phrase privateer, and he attacked the Spanish gold galleons. And Elizabeth was delighted, but he was not under the British Admiralty. And the Wagner Group, you know, is a very similar model, but they all pay lots of money to the government that condones them. So I think it's a NATO level concern. And if it means amending Article 5 a little bit to say, look, it's not just kinetic, it's this other stuff and it's got to stop. And the response should be proportionate. Absolutely. I'm not saying, you know, start firing cruise missiles at these folks, but there are certainly ways technologically, and for instance, the Citizen Lab at, at the U of T has tons of expertise in this area uh, and, and could really be you know, an important uh, player in coming up with, with the appropriate solution. But uh, I think the cyber problem, and if you're a patient at one of those hospitals around Windsor, Ontario, um, it's no laughing matter. It's it's very serious. Yeah. No. Absolutely. No. I think that's. I think that's uh, all good. Um, you you've mentioned, of course, the fact that we're not achieving that two percent of gross domestic product that NATO would like us to do in terms of our defense spending. Um, right. And you know, we've had some reports that you know we told NATO on the one hand that we would do it. And then on another hand, we said, no, we'll never do it. Um, there has been discussion in the past about, you know, either reducing the size or the intended size of the Canadian Armed Forces or to becoming more of a niche player um, in terms of some particular capability or suite of capabilities, but not having the full, you know, uh, multi-faceted uh, military capability in all domains. Do you do you have any thoughts about that? Do you think that we need to have a, a real serious think about the structure and size of the Canadian Armed Forces if we in fact are not prepared or cannot invest at the level we should be? Tough question. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. my uh, my initial reaction to that would be you still need all three services. You know, when you think of the Western Pacific, people say, well, you really only need uh, a naval force and, and an air force, you know, so maybe we don't need tanks and we, and we don't need the army. If you go to Okinawa and look at the 58,000 American troops there, uh, yeah, lots of Marines, lots of air, you know, lots of Navy, but they have army there as well. Because if, if you're going to hold uh, or take and hold territory, you, you, need, you need armed forces, not, not just the other. And this is what we're finding in Yemen, right, with the Houthis. Um, it's one thing to deliver cruise missiles and other, uh, you know, other ordnance to send a message. But ultimately, um, I'm not so sure you're going to have a whole lot of luck resurrecting the Red Sea and the Suez Canal as a main shipping lane mm -hmm. until somebody goes in and shuts down that threat. And, you know, 
naval assets and air assets are great up to a point. So, so then you say, okay, well, no, of course we need an army. And what we're doing in Latvia, I think, is bang on. Um, we we just need more of it, and 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 that's all. Of course, you know, land forces, um, our naval forces. With our three coastlines the way they are and climate change producing a Northwest Passage that's going to get busier, um, we're going to need naval assets. Um, but why aren't our Halifax, you know, um, ships more involved in the Red Sea exercise? Because they don't have Aegis air defense cover technology. The new combatant ships will. And that's great, but they're you know 10, 15 years down the road. So I, I do think you need a navy in, in this world. Um, I think we desperately need a submarine capability. And if and if we could get the percentage up to two percent, which is another maybe twenty billion a year, um, I would put half of that towards a nuclear powered submarine contingent. Um, the ones, the Ohio class in the U.S., they carry 150 cruise missiles. I mean, they shoot way more vertical than they do torpedoes, you know, horizontal. And then you come to air. Now, in air assets, to your earlier question, um, I happen to think that the last jet fighter pilot has already been born. Hmm. Um, he or she may be quite young, right? Maybe may still in daycare. But uh, but the F-35 could very well be our final major jet fighter platform. And I would love to see, to your point about something that Canada could really shine on, is uh, take the, you know, the MQ-9 Reaper type large drone, beef it up, make it do 80% of what the F-35 can do, but do it at a, at a at a price point that makes it so compelling that it really does come to replace crude fighter jets. Um, I don't know if you were embarrassed, I was embarrassed when we couldn't even shoot down the Chinese balloon and we had to ask the Americans to come in and, and, and do that for us. A drone that I'm contemplating, and again, I would do it jointly with the South Koreans. I'd bring in the Danes. They, they have great design. It'll be the flashiest looking drone on the market, but it's got to come in at a price point of, you know, 5 million bucks and not the 20 million that, that the Reaper costs currently. But it's certainly not the 130 that you pay for, uh, for an F-35. And that sort of technology, price performance improvement is what, tech has done for the last 30 years it just hasn't done it as well in the military because and when you go into the table in my book on military contractors you know the Lockheed Martins and so on um, they're not going to be the ones moving to the competitive displacement dynamic of something that you know replaces the sixth gen fighter right so that would be an area that that again I think there's room for some of the democracies to get really creative and 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 move the needle. Just just a historic example, and this one's in the book, but I love it. When the British brought in the longbow archer in the 1300s, and they won the Battle of Agincourt and so on against the French, they defeated the then prevailing weapon system, the medieval knight, the you know on horseback. But it wasn't just because the longbow was a better weapon. It cost a fraction of a medieval knight. So you could either decide to put many more archers on the field, or you could put fewer of them on the field and save some money. And that's the kind of you know, revolution in munitions that Canada could be a part of and, and get some you know, credit and some, hey, hey, maybe... Uh, Maybe they're worth inviting to the table. Right, right. Okay, that's good. Um, so we did have a question about, you know, the potential threat of a of a of a of a Trump rerun. Um, 
Uh, but I think I'd just like to expand on that a little bit, you know, broaden the question out a bit. Um, so let me do that, please. So uh, over the past few weeks and months, the West has become demonstrably less interested in supporting Ukraine. Uh, some evidence of this is the current impasse in the U.S. Congress that is refusing additional military aid to Ukraine without concurrently dealing with the U.S. border issue. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan, there was a saying that we have the watches, but the Taliban have the time. And on the long run, that yeah. assessment was, I think, correct. And the Taliban are now back in control of that country. So do you believe that the current democratic political systems and processes will be able to support the sort of strategic and long-term approach that you're talking about to dealing with autocracies over a long Cold 2.0, Cold War 2.0? Can we do it? Yeah, that's obviously a big question. It's an important question. It's a question that deserves, you know, an hour and a half just under another itself. seminar yes <laughs> but but a couple of quick observations again looking into history the americans have had an isolationist streak in their history uh, they were late coming to the first world war they were late coming to the second world war um and you know, this America first dynamic that, that Trump is playing and some other candidates have been playing as well, you know, plays to that historic, you know, tradition uh, in the American uh, sort of historical context. What's new and what plays, I think, directly to, you know, my narrative in Cold War 2.0 is that Trump is honestly and truly uh, inclined to the authoritarian model. And I don't think he thinks a whole lot about Ukraine. Uh, he sure didn't when he was president. Uh, we know what happened there in terms of the negotiations for additional military assistance. And I could absolutely see him doing a deal with Putin to to deal with Ukraine and, as I say, sell Ukraine down the river. Now, I think the Europeans will pick up the slack. So in an ironic sense, the U.S. pulling back might finally get, for instance, the Germans to step up. The French foreign minister was there just the other day. Um, so if that's a silver lining, that's, that's fine. But... Again, uh, I, I have a section in the book where, you know, America is the indispensable democracy. And particularly in Ukraine, where all that we're doing is we're spending some money mainly on weapons made in the U.S. or in Europe or in Canada. And there are no body bags coming back to the U.S., in Canada, and for five percent of the U.S. military budget, you, you you get to bring the Russian military to its knees because you haven't engaged, you know, U Ukrainian community that wants to survive. Um, again, this is why we need to call it a Cold War. That the last one took forty years. This one might take just as long. So. You know, we need staying power. And I think what was interesting about the fall success in 2022, you know, when the Ukrainians took back big swaths of land outside Kherson and so forth, and that built an expectation that, ah, with some, you know, NATO tanks, they can finish the job. Um, I think that is part of what is now leading to this exhaustion, but we have no right to be exhausted. It's it's the Ukrainians that are putting in the heavy lifting. We're, we're just writing a check, but we need to write that check. The one that will take not just treasure, but blood is the defense of Taiwan. Because all the war games show that in the first three weeks of the battle of the Taiwan Strait, not one, but two aircraft carriers will go down on the U.S. side. 
and each of them, you know, five, six, seven thousand personnel, and another fifteen to twenty support ships. I mean, it'll be bloody. The first month, there'll be twenty to twenty-five thousand American dead. And because I mentioned they were, you know, based in in Okinawa, fifty-eight thousand Americans, the Chinese will take out Okinawa. So Japanese will die. So Japan is in there. Um, I was amazed when I was in Taiwan, um, the relationship that Taiwan has with Japan. I mean, Japan occupied Taiwan from 1895 to 1945. The presidential office, like the equivalent of the White House, is actually an old Japanese era colonial building. When I met with one of the uh, defense analysts at the Ministry of Defense, it was in an old Japanese, et cetera, et cetera. So, so Japan is in, the Americans will be in, um, but that one will be bloody. And the reason I'm writing a book on Taiwan is the follow-up to Cold War II.0 is I'm very nervous that that isolationist tendency in the States might rear its head on Taiwan when the chips really are down. And we need many more thousands of opinion makers in the States to be very convinced that Taiwan, you know, is just like France and it's just like England after, you know, the Battle of Britain. And, and we, we have to be there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me turn back to Canada just for, for a couple of things. Um, you know, we, we talked about Trump and we talked about, you know, that American experience of isolationism and so on. The other thing you referred to, though, was what I think the term you used was appeasers, you know, within the democracies. Mm. And, and I think that goes hand in hand with this, with that long term view, you know, that we we have to concern ourselves as well with, with what we're doing and how we're how we're managing the threats to ourselves. And I remember years ago, um, and some people on this on this call might might remember that the, the night we had a uh, a mass dinner in the RCMI, and the guest speaker was Dick Fadden, and mm. he was at the time the head of CSIS, and he brought with him a CBC reporter with a camera. And after we were pretty well through a lot of wine and a lot of port, and people were sort of fading off, he gave his presentation and said that you know he had evidence to suggest that there were Canadian politicians that were in the in the pockets of the Chinese. Now, this was back in the early 1990s. Um, now we have an investment, not an investigation. Well, it is an investigation, but we have a, a commission starting up soon to take uh, testimony on what happened in terms of the uh, federal elections and the and the role of China interfering in our in our in our democratic processes. Um, what what do you think we need to do about that and how we. How significant do you view that problem to be? Yeah, my my sense is that China has a strategy to operationalize um, a number of people found in Chinese diasporas, but it was always thus, again, the Fenian raids. 1837, right? I mean, right on our border with the Americans. Um, one of the movies I, I watched recently was, uh, you know, Mick Connolly and, and the Irish, you know, raising money in Boston and so on and so forth. So, so this idea of, of using diasporas to promote your own uh, political objectives is, is not new. Um, what is somewhat new is that the ability of the Chinese to do that is heightened because they are a serious, you know, world global power. And so at a minimum, we need that, you know, foreign agent registration system that many other democracies have done. We have to do it though, in the best rule of law, human rights, traditions, you know, we can't become them. We, we have to be very, very careful about how we go about it. But the one case that I did hear about where there was a Canadian member of parliament who had family in Hong Kong 
And the Chinese authorities in Hong Kong had spoken to them and made it very clear that there might be repercussions and so on and so forth. Um, that sort of behavior is, is obviously very concerning. The two Michaels, that behavior was very concerning. And, and the brazenness with which it was done, I thought for sure, once Ottawa and Washington had worked out the deal to let Meng, you know, go back to China, that Beijing would wait at least a month, a month and a half before they released the two Michaels. They same released day. them the same day. Same day, yeah. In effect, telling us, you know, don't F with us because, and, you know, and then just two, three days ago, um, Melanie Jolie and the Chinese um, either ambassador or the foreign minister, they were going to patch things up, they were going to move forward and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm all for, you know, moving forward, but uh, I have a long memory on these things and, and we need to protect ourselves and we need to take some steps that, uh, that address the kind of issue that, that you spoke about for sure. Okay, I'm going to um, just ask you one more question uh, on behalf of uh, the audience, and then we'll wrap it up. We're running a little bit longer than usual, but that's good. That's a good thing. Um, and I guess I the question would relate to uh, really a key part of your book uh, and your and your thesis, and that is artificial intelligence. You know, we're now seeing all kinds of discussion out there about whether artificial intelligence is a good thing whether it's a danger, um, whether it's going to be used as a very uh, effective uh, means of spreading disinformation. Uh, you know, you've got deep fake videos going out. Um, what's, what's your view? And is, is this something that we need to, to somehow get a grip on now? Because I presume the technology is going to continue to improve as these various systems learn more and more and more, they're gonna get better and better. Um, is this something we need to concern ourselves with? Does it need some kind of regime to, to control what's going on? Or is this just going to continue to evolve in ways that we can't imagine and we can't ultimately potentially control? What's your thought about that? I have a saying about new technology, which is that we, typically overestimate the short-term impact of new technology, but we underestimate the long-term impact. So I think AI is real. Um, my wife is uh, a chat GPT addict, uh, if I can uh, use that <laughs> phrase, and I hope she won't watch this, uh, this recording. Um, but it is a fascinating tool and it is going to impact virtually, you know, all white collar type and, and lots of blue collar type employment and so forth. I don't think there'll be, you know, massive job losses. I think it'll be like the computer. It'll augment everybody's job, but it won't necessarily replace your physician, your dentist and so on and so forth. In terms of, you know, rushing to regulate it, I'd be, a little bit careful about the cadence for that. I'm always nervous with a new technology when the big players, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Amazon, say, oh, we need to regulate this um, because they're going to set up rules that only the big players can abide by. And the little guys coming into the, into the space uh, may well be blocked. So you need balance. Um, if you look at what the Europeans have done in their latest uh, attempt, uh, I think they're on the right track. Just focus on the really high risk use cases, but not a general regime that sort of freezes everything. And you may recall, Dan, about what, a year ago, there was that letter signed by a thousand technology guru saying, let's let's put it on hold for six months. I mean, that was naivete in the extreme. Do you, do you think 
the Chinese are going to put AI on hold for six months to respect our willingness to, you know, maybe regulate it and so on. Uh, and that's my point in the book that, uh, look, whatever we do, uh, it is a race, absolutely, with the autocrats. Yeah. And something like, you know, shutting down our, our R&D to wait for the government process and the law to catch up uh, that's that's not the way to go i think like other technologies you know we'll, we'll learn a lot more over the next number of years we'll take little bits and pieces and say look this is a bias is a problem you know we can't have banks using technology to make mortgage approvals where the database has a fundamental flaw and that we can fix and that we need to fix. But to go from that to say all AI should 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 stop for six months it is an overreaction. So there's a Canadian, you know, middle ground that uh, is called for. Ever the good Canadian approach to things, balance, absolutely. Everything in moderation, there you go. <laughs> I think it was actually the Greeks who started that, but uh, well, I think so. you're right. we would do well, we would do well to continue <laughs> that narrative. Okay. Well, listen, folks, um, this has been great. Dan, just uh, sorry, but Dan, just yeah, go ahead. one last point on AI. Sure. My book opens in the introduction with a Chinese missile attack on Taiwan. And what will be critical in that exercise is the quality of the AI on the Taiwanese and the American side. And if you think about it actually conceptually, AI could become a very important piece of a deterrence mm. structure. Because if, if the AI is so good that it's really hard to get past it, um, I know a lot of people don't like to think about nuclear weapons as being helpful in deterring you know, major conflict but it has been, um, AI might do something like that at the conventional weapon level. So, you know, let's not just think of all the awful worst case scenarios for AI. It might actually have some real crown jewels in it for, you yeah. know, helping peace and, and deterrence along to then, you know, keep, um, autocrats with with warring intentions at bay yeah it's it's always good to end a session like this on a positive note on a hope there note. you go there you go <laughs> i think that's a good thing um right george well let me uh let me wrap this up with a couple of things um the first thing i need to do is i need to thank some people because it takes a few people to make something like this uh presentation happen so I will mention some names. Sylvia Lau is our director of events and communications. Um, Benuja Sarandan is our events coordinator, and she's the one, the, she's the wizard behind the screen and makes it all happen. Uh, Eric Morris is our director of publications, so he's putting material out there for people to see. Um, so those are three of the key players from the RCMI side, and uh, and I thank them very much for their support in these events. Um, obviously, George, I need to thank you. It's getting late over there. Hopefully you'll maybe wander down to a cafe or something and have a, have, well, we won't say, we won't say what you have, but anyways, you'll, you'll enjoy, enjoy, I'm sure. And I would like to thank all of the uh, people who attended today. Um, I, I think it's been a fascinating presentation and, um, I think for those who are interested in the book, I believe that on I believe that on the flyer, uh, you could the book is due out in early March, but pre-orders for the book can be found uh, or submitted to Simon and Schuster, the publisher. Is that correct, George? Is that the way to go right now? Yeah, you you can find uh, the Simon and Schuster dot com site, or frankly, Amazon has it now as well. Okay, but but you won't get it until march 5 till march 5 okay until march 5 so with that i thank everyone once again 
I look forward to seeing you all at our next expert speaker presentation. Please take care, have a good afternoon, or in George's case, a very good night, and thank you all. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.